Okay, so today uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce you our uh, speaker of the fourth uh, Koki Colloquium already of this series. So we have um, <coughs> we have Cindy Regal from uh, the University of Colorado, Angela. So she's from the US. So she studied physics and she finished in the Lawrence University in Wisconsin in 2000. Then she did a PhD in physics at the University of Colorado. She got the degree in 2006 under the supervision of David Jean. And she actually did beautiful experiments with fermionic ultracoal gases. In particular, she observed uh, or she demonstrated resonance condensation of fermionic atomic pairs. She observed the emergence of a molecular BC from a Fermi gas and created ultracoal molecules uh, from fermions. Then she moved to Caltech for a postdoc with a Millikan uh, postdoctoral fellow. And she stayed there from 2007 to 2009. And it is at this moment that she started to do experiments, not with so many degrees of freedom as in coal gases, but uh, with very few, in particular with the degrees of freedom you have in nanomechanical systems, like membranes and so on, and also with uh, neutral atoms, so uh, single neutral atoms. So in particular, as I said, she was very interested in cavity optomechanical experiments with membranes inside cavities, as well as with uh, uh, microwave uh, optomechanics namely using a mechanical degree of freedom to couple to microwave photons in cavities. Then in 2010, she moved as, a, as an assistant professor back to Boulder uh, in the University of Colorado, and she was also an associate GILA fellow. And in 2015, she was promoted to a full GILA fellow and uh, as an associate professor in 2016. And as I said, she's very interested in doing these experiments with uh, cavity nanomechanics, as well as with uh, trapping individual neutral atoms in optical tweezers. So she got many awards already. So in particular, her PhD thesis was really awarded, and she got several prizes, and one of, th one of those being the, the APS division of AMO Physics Thesis Prize winner in 2007. She also got an early career award for scientists and engineers, a, pres a presidential one. And she's also a fellow from the American Physical Society since 2016. So it is therefore a uh, great pleasure to have you here, Cindy, for these days uh, until Friday. And we look very much forward to listening to your talk. So let's welcome our speaker. All right. So what I'm going to tell you about today is prospects for a quantum electro-optic interface uh, via micromechanical motion. So this is a collaboration between my group at Jilla in Boulder and that of uh, Conrad Lehnert, who also has a group at Jilla, uh, where his group really focuses on superconducting devices and my group focuses on optical systems. And we are making a hybrid device uh, that utilizes is micromechanical motion. So the experiments that I talk about sort of belong to a larger class of experiments that people are calling these days cavity uh, quantum optomechanics. And this field really comes from you know, five or 10 years ago, the ability to take micro or nano mechanical objects and really uh, apply forces from radiation pressure <laughs> in order to manipulate that motion. So we could start to do things like do the equivalent of laser cooling uh, nano or micro mechanical objects. And these objects have taken a variety of different forms, um, sort of a variety of effectively moving mirrors that form some portion of a cavity, um, like a cantilever with a mirror on it, or um, some whispering gallery mode, or in our case, we'll look at uh, a really sort of vibrating piece of silicon nitride. There's also sort of equivalent physics that you can observe if you look at an LC circuit and you modulate its capacitance um, via some little metal plate um, that's vibrating up and down. So all of these systems, if you've heard about these types of experiments, you probably think about it as you know, light sort of controlling micromechanical motion. Uh, but these types of systems sort of go the other well, way as well, where the micromechanical motion can actually control the light. Uh, at least at some level in which we sort of have a weak nonlinearity that's introduced by this mechanical element. So typically these experiments don't have a really strong coupling in the sense that a single photon doesn't have a big effect on the mechanical element, um, but we can effectively make nonlinear media that can control the light. So as an outline of this talk, 
I'm going to tell you first a little bit about the motivation for the particular application of these micromechanical things that we're thinking about, which is a quantum electro-optic converter. I'll tell you about the ideas behind making such a converter with our micromechanical objects and the requirements for doing so. I'll tell you about our converter hardware and the protocol. I'll tell you how close we are to quantum. Uh, note the title of this talk is Prospects for some Quantum Electro-Optic Converter. And we think we're getting closer, but uh, basically all the measurements that we're making right now are classical tests of whether we're pretty close. Uh, then I'll talk about a specific experiment that we've done recently where we've actually been able to see correlations between the electrical and optical domain through the micromechanical element and demonstrated a converter that's nearly 50% efficient, uh, which is a nice metric for, for a number of quantum systems. As I mentioned, uh, these experiments involve both what we call electromechanics, which is sort of these superconducting devices coupled to mechanical elements like Conrad Lehnert's group does, as well as optomechanical realizations, which is really optical light coupled to the mechanical elements. And my group works um, much more on the optomechanical side. So I'll take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about where we are with respect to controlling mechanics purely with optomechanical systems. And that'll give you a flavor of, as we go on with the electro-optic device, the type of measurement capabilities that we have. So I'll talk about things like cooling our mechanical membrane to the ground state, um, squeezing light uh, using the me mechanical object, uh, and looking at some classic experiments in, in quantum measurement. OK, so our motivation for this work in making an electro-optic converter is that um, microwave systems have become quite powerful in terms of the ability to create arbitrary quantum states using superconducting qubits. And so we have this uh, picture here of, you know, at the bottom of a dilution refrigerator, these experiments can happen in a system where microwave fields around 10 gigahertz are in their ground state. Uh, but if we wanted to communicate uh, quantum states over long distances, the natural platform to do this in is uh, optical photons, right, which are robust in a room temperature environment. So you think, would think that a sort of quantum connection uh, between these two domains uh, might be nice. And so you can imagine, one, this could be useful for a sort of quantum network vision, or maybe if you wanted your quantum nodes to be <laughs> superconducting qubits, uh, and you wanted the channels to be optical light, you would need such a converter. Uh, and maybe even sort of futuristic visions of you have a bunch of qubits at the bottom of your dilution refrigerator and you want to have them talk to each other in some sort of modular way, maybe light would even be useful in that context. Okay, so these are futuristic ideas related to hardware that hasn't been made yet, um, but the basic idea is this, this connection could be useful. So how do we propose to do this with a micro-mechanical element? So what we're going to do is take a vibrating object, in our case it will be a sort of thin film of silicon nitride stretched across a frame, and it'll vibrate in a, in a mode something like this at a megahertz frequency. And that mechanical motion is going to modulate both the resonant frequency of an LC circuit that's coupled to a microwave port and the resonant frequency of an optical cavity that's coupled to an optical port. So this is a Fabry-Perot cavity here, and this diagram is not at all to scale. The membrane won't be vibrating that much. It'll just be um, moving a very small amount within the standing wave of the cavity. So it's a little dielectric slab moving within that standing wave effectively changes the length of the cavity. So there's a number of different requirements that you would have if you really want this converter to be able to, to transduce quantum states. So let's say I had a single microwave photon and I wanted it to transduce it into, say, a single optical photon. One is you would want this converter to work bidirectionally so that you could have unitary transformation. So I should be able to take a microwave signal and move it to the optical domain and I should be able to go back the other direction. I want the system to be efficient, right? This is always a, a criterion in the, in the quantum world. I talk about this in terms of um, photon number preserving when I talk about efficiency. So if I have some signal in the microwave domain, I want all of it to get over here. And similarly, I don't want any uh, signal reflected off of this port. I also want to have low added noise. 
So if you look at this picture, one clear potential source of added noise in this thing I've told you about is the fact that I have this mechanical element that's at a megahertz frequency that is quite occupied uh, at even dilution refrigerator temperatures. So that's a clear potential source of added noise in the system. And I'll talk about why that's OK and how it's related to some cavity optomechanics ideas. Uh, there can also be added noise from a variety of other sources. Uh, you know, there's light near a superconductor, and that ends up creating quasiparticles in the superconductor and adds noise to, to the system. So this device that I've just told you about, uh, in principle, it operates very similar to the type of uh, sort of electro-optic devices that you might find on your optical table every day. So this device here is an electro-optic modulator that maybe has something like lithium niobate in it. And in principle, uh, this type of modulator could also achieve the metrics that I just said on the previous slide. Uh, and it's, a, it's obviously a very common object, uh, but it's not at all efficient with current technologies. So if you look at, um, if you thought about this sort of photon conversion efficiency number for your typical electro-optic modulator, uh, you know, four things that people made a couple of years ago that were optimized for these sorts of things, it was something like 10 to the minus four. Okay, so they're, they're very inefficient uh, and you know, not really set up for the sort of cryogenic experiments that would be required. Now people are working in the direction of taking these things and making them uh, quantum, but I think there's a certain advantage that we have with these micromechanical elements. You can sort of think of it as instead of you know, opening up your drawer, pulling out the crystal that nature gave you, we're sort of engineering uh, the nonlinearities that we need via the micromechanical motion. And uh, sort of as I will tell you, uh, the devices that we're making are indeed, uh, the, to our knowledge, the, the sort of best, most efficient, lowest added noise electro-optic converters that, that you can find. OK, so let's talk a little bit about this idea of the added noise and how I think about this micromechanical element and the fact that it's coupled to its environment and that we're using it for this electro-optic conversion. So within the context of quantum cavity optomechanics or this goal of having low added noise in our system, we can think about two rates in the problem. And these rates might be what I might call an optical measurement rate or a photon-phonon exchange rate with some propagating field. And on the other hand, some thermalization rate with the mechanical environment. So generally, our goal in these cavity optomechanical systems has been to make this uh, measurement rate or exchange rate large um, compared to the thermalization rate with the mechanical environment. And this is the criteria for having low added noise in our converter. It's also the same criteria that would allow you to laser cool one of these mechanical elements to its ground state. Um, so this is sort of ubiquitous within this field. So this optical measurement rate, I can think of in terms of a, a few parameters. Uh, so one is the, the coupling between the mechanical element and the cavity. So how much cavity uh, shift do I get for given sort of zero point motion movement of this object? Uh, the photon number that I'm effectively pumping the system with or measuring with, depending on how you're thinking about it, comes into the problem. Uh, remember I said that single photons have pretty small effects in these systems, so we're generally putting a lot of photons into the system. And also if I'm thinking about the propagating fields, I want to think about the cavity damping. So as we've come along in this field of cavity optomechanics in the experiments, what this typically means is we want to find systems where we can put a lot of light in a small cavity with a small object and be able to do this without that little object just being heated up by the light. Right? If I stick my finger in a laser beam, usually it's going to get hot. Uh, but in these type of systems, what we do is we find the right materials so that this doesn't happen. OK, and so we want to compare uh, this rate here to some thermalization rate with the environment. And that will be given by uh, the phonon occupation due to the environment uh, and the mechanical damping rate. So the mechanical damping rate would be inversely proportional to the mechanical quality factor. So if it takes a long time for energy to decay out of a mechanical object, then it's going to take a long time for sort of noise from the environment to leak in. 
And so what this means is also in this field, we seek um, high mechanical quality factor objects at cold starting temperatures. In terms of uh, sort of typical language in the field, we often refer to this uh, in terms of cooperativity. Uh, so some cooperativity, which is a ratio of these different values, we want to be much larger than uh, the number of thermal phonons. And again, this determines, can I ground state laser cool? Can I do things with low added noise? Um, can I reach the standard quantum limit of displacement detection that I'll talk about later? OK, so let's go into a little bit more the, the different couplings that are involved with this hybrid system that I had described at the beginning. So I'll sort of take it into a couple of different pieces and uh, show you the actual coupling that, that we're looking at. All right, so let's just first focus on the electrical part of the system. So we have an LC resonant circuit. And I have uh, one of the capacitor plates I'm allowing to move. And again, in my sort of cartoon diagram, it's moving a lot more than it uh, would in reality. But changes that capacitance, it changes the resonant frequency. And I can describe um, the interaction as a coupling between um, B dagger plus B, which is the mechanical displacement, and the photon number with this coupling factor that I'm calling GE for um, the electrical coupling. Now what we do in these experiments is we actually pump the system with a red detuned tone. And if we linearize about that tone, uh, we get a sort of beam <coughs> splitter coupling. Um, that's sort of this phonon-photon exchange rate that I was referring to, to before. This is the same thing I would do if I wanted to uh, sort of effectively laser cool or damp the mechanical motion. I red detune my pump from the cavity resonance. So if you want to make an analogy to laser cooling of atoms, it's like red detuning of the atomic transition. And here we're red detuning of uh, some density of states that just, that's defined by the cavity. Okay. So the interesting thing about our experiments is we have a very parallel sort of vision between that electrical domain and an optical domain. So we have the exact same coupling um, in the optomechanical case. So we have uh, this dielectric slab that's moving within this fabry pro cavity. Uh, we have the same Hamiltonian. We also pump the optomechanical system red detuned, and we get another phonon-photon exchange rate. And then physically, in our experiment, what we try to do is actually merge these two things. So we just try to make the mechanical element that's talking to both of them be the actually the same thing. OK, so back to our original schematic and a little bit of an overview of what we'll do. So we'll pump our microwave cavity red detune. We'll pump our optical cavity red detune. And then we'll stick a little bit of a tone in near cavity resonance. And it'll be converted to a sideband over here. And if I ultimately want to think about the quantum state that I inject, it's sort of, I think about injecting it at this frequency space, though right now we're just injecting coherent states and, and see what comes in and out. So I can think about the problem in terms of these photon phonon exchange rates that I was talking about earlier as I was talking about cooperativities. And so they just both depend upon couplings and pump strength in the two different domains. I can put up a formula here then for if I think about the system as a sort of two port network, I can think about a scattering parameter that tells me uh, about going from the electrical to the optical domain or from the optical to the electrical domain. And I can write out a formula here that tells me uh, the efficiency of that conversion. And there's a couple of different numbers here. So there's this optical rate, uh, gamma O, and there's this electrical rate, gamma E. Uh, there's an efficiency of the converter, eta, and then there's a gain factor here. And in the experiments, what we want to do is we don't want this to be an amplifier. So we want the gain to be 1. We want it to e be efficient, so we want this efficiency to be 1 as well. Uh, it turns out the mechanical loss, which is just basically the bare mechanical line width, can be much smaller than these damping rates. The damping rates in our experiment will end up being sort of kilohertz scale, uh, and that will be the, the bandwidth of some converter that we would make. Now, a kilohertz bandwidth electro-optic modulator, if someone tried to sell you one of those for a classical application mm. in your lab, you would probably tell them, no, no thanks, right? That would be sort of hard to work with. Um, but for these quantum applications where we're thinking about first things we 
we could do trying to connect to a superconducting qubit, it's easier to think about working in a, in a very small bandwidth regime. So if we look at this formula a little bit more, uh, we see that in order to get this thing to be uh, unit conversion efficiency, I basically want to set the optical exchange rate equal to the electrical exchange rate. So I basically want to impedance match the system. Now I put this little question mark exclamation here because the, the physical systems that I'm working with in the electrical and the optical domains, you can imagine the wavelength scales of those things are very different. And so you could imagine that um, these rates end up being very different depending on the platform. But sort of strangely, in these two different platforms, these rates can be very similar, actually for very similar um, intercavity photon numbers. So the impedance matching, it doesn't turn out to be a problem. Okay, so what we did in first experiments with this device is, again, think about it as a two-port network where we think about um, reflection and transmission off of uh, the two different ports, the microwave port and the optical port, and we try to characterize just for a box that defines the converter and not all of the measurement chains that are defined by these different symbols out here, what is the conversion efficiency of some signal? And it turns out by sort of clever combinations of these S parameters, you can, you can calibrate this and determine the efficiency of the converter. So our results from a year or two ago showed that we could get 10% um, conversion efficiency um, operating the converter at a temperature of 4 Kelvin and adding about 1,000 quanta of added noise. So that's pretty far <laughs> from being able to, to transfer a, a single photon. Um, but this 10 percent efficiency gave us some uh, confidence that you know, these micromechanical elements, we actually were engineering geometries in a way that let us do something much more efficient than, than had been done with lithium niobate. So what I'll tell you about today are some quite recent results in which we have um, higher efficiency. Um, we have lower noise that's telling us that it's not crazy to be operating sort of a superconducting uh, electromechanical circuit near an optomechanical device. And we're also starting to not just measure um, these S parameters in a, in a network analysis, but actually look at correlations between the electrical and optical domain, although still in a, in a classical regime. And these experiments are done in a dilution for um, at less than 100 millikelvin. So we really have these optimechanical mechanical devices operating there. Okay, oh and yeah, so speaking of a dilution refrigerator, so this is the platform in which we currently do our experiments. So this is a guy with uh, laser goggles, um, actually putting something onto a cold stage of a dilution refrigerator. Uh, it sits horizontally on an optical table, and so we can send uh, light in the front and get it out the back or vice versa um, through free space, very low numerical aperture ports of the, of the system. And this is what the cold plate of the system looks like. Uh, there's a hole somewhere in this box for light to get into, and then you see these uh, microwave cables that go in um, and efficiently collect the, the microwave signal from the device. And it's all shielded inside of these, inside of these boxes here. <coughs> So the system gets down to a temperature of 40 millikelvin, uh, and these mechanical elements that we're using, these uh, silicon nitride stretched membranes uh, that I guess I didn't explain too much earlier, but they actually uh, thermalize to about 80 millikelvin. So even though we're putting quite a bit of optical power onto these devices, um, they aren't heating up a lot, which is a, a big important factor in, in doing these types of experiments. Okay, so let's get a little bit more to the, to the hardware of the device. So what we do is this is a sort of top-down view of our micro-mechanical element. And what's shown here is the color scale shows you uh, the blue part is going down at the time when the red part is going up. So it's a so sort of mode that's going like this. It's a little bit of a funny shape because on one corner of it, um, we're putting a superconducting niobium film that's sort of a thicker part of this, this stretch drum. These mechanical objects that we're using really are drums. Uh, they're a half a millimeter on a side and they're about 50 nanometers thick. And if they were to be sort of a relaxed material, they'd have frequencies in the <coughs> kilohertz range, uh, but we, they're really stressed very naturally, which increases some oscillator energy compared to some thermal scale in a way that's, that's very helpful for these types of experiments. So we refer to them as, uh, as tensioned membranes. 
And we put the optical spot of the device over here and the niobium thin film over here. And, and again, these are things that I didn't put a picture here, but you can, you can really see with your naked eye because it's a half a millimeter scale. So there's a lot of people who are working with quantum optomechanical systems that are really nanoscale. They're more like a nanometer, hundreds of nanometer scale. Uh, but we decided to work with these larger systems partly because in these type of devices, you really want to keep your superconductor away from your light. So this is some way that we can imagine that they at least be somewhat separated in the device. OK, so when we make the device that has this LC circuit on it, we make what's called a flip chip. So we take, uh, to make the capacitor, we actually take two different chips, one that contains uh, the wire for the LC circuit, and the other that contains this membrane, and we flip them on top of each other. And the distance that the two chips are away from each other uh, is that uh, gap of the capacitor plates that I showed in the original image. And so this is what the final device looks like, and we take that whole thing and we put it inside a Fabry-Perot cavity in order to get our optomechanical coupling. So this is sort of the, the hardware for making the device. So we have uh, a box here uh, that sort of uh, shields everything as well as allows a, a cavity that we actually wirelessly couple the electromechanical device to where the electromechanical and mechanical device are in this red part here. These blue parts here are optical cavity mirrors, and we have some piezos that just move the, the mirrors along this axis. And this whole thing is um, cryogenically compatible. This is a picture of an assembled device. So the typical finesse that we have in these systems is, uh, you know, sort of, uh, it's a typo there, that's a, 410 to the 4. Uh, <laughs> uh, but we have very little degrees of freedom. Uh, we put it all together, we sort of epoxy it uh, in one place, and then we cool it down. This is sort of um, motivated by this sort of atomic cavity QED experiments, where you sort of put your cavity mirrors together, uh, and then you put it in vacuum, and you, and you leave it alone. In this case, though, because we need to cool these to cryogenic temperatures, uh, we actually uh, use a special epoxy, uh, Stycast 2850, and we try to make all of the joints very symmetric so that when we cool it down, the cavity mirrors don't go like this <laughs> uh, and cause a problem with the cavity. Okay, so there's many different parts that, uh, that go into this. We put it all together, uh, and then we can measure these scattering parameters. Okay, so network analysis of this, uh, of this electro-optic device. So the gray curves here show what happens when effectively we don't have the converter on. We aren't impedance matched in the system. So you can see that, uh, for example, in the uh, electrical domain, a lot, of the, a lot of the signal is reflected, uh, and we don't get anything through. So these um, transmission parameters are zero. And then we turn on the coupling, and we can see that we have um, some transmission in the system, and we can actually see uh, the reflection signal getting pulled out, right? So there's no more reflection at this condition. Uh, where this delta refers to the detuning of our signal that we're measuring compared to this um, pumping. And in the optical domain, we can see this as, as well, although it looks a little funnier for a couple different reasons. We can see that this impedance matching makes sense in the sense that um, we can measure an efficiency of the conversion as a function of uh, the, the coupling rates of the device. So uh, we actually are varying one of the coupling rates here and finding that uh, the efficiency peaks where they're equal. So the efficiency in this particular measurement was 43%, and we've been able to reach 48% uh, in, in some recent devices. And this is all through all the ports of dilution refrigerator get, getting uh, uh, sort of the, the light out of the, out of the cavity box. So what about the added noise of the system? So I've sort of hinted at a variety of things that could, could go wrong, that could cause you not to be able to take a single microwave photon and go to a single optical photon, and what are the different uh, values and, and where are we at? So I've talked about thermal motion of the membrane as sort of this goal of reaching high cooperativity so that we can work faster than it couples to the environment. Uh, I've talked about this idea that, well, we're putting a lot of uh, optical light by a superconductor, and well, that could, be a, that could definitely be a problem. And then another thing that we have run into is some parameter noise in the LC circuit uh, that actually causes some problems. So instead of telling you sort of the whole multidimensional parameter space, I'll give you a couple of examples of devices that we've achieved. So this is the 
sort of total bandwidth of the device, how hard we're pumping it. This is the efficiency. This is the mechanical quality factor that we achieved. So these membrane resonators typically uh, have quality factors of a million or more um, at cryogenic temperatures. And if we look at the, these numbers here, this is the added noise. The added noise referred to the input of the converter. And we see that the, the, the total numbers can get down to around uh, 10 photons or so in the first couple tries of this. So this is much better than 1,000, like we were doing before, and not way too far from 1. Uh, again, this is referred to the input. And uh, this added noise here, for example, refers to cooling the, the mechanical element down to a few phonons. Okay, so we're sort of at that level in these hybrid devices. Uh, but we're not all the way down to one, and there's some things that we have to deal with. Uh, you know, the, this parameter noise being a big thing, and also just getting things a little bit more light in there in order to decrease this thermal motion before other bad things happen. So let's talk about something that's maybe slightly more interesting than the, you know, adding up all the noise numbers. And that is sort of looking at the noise in the different ports um, and, and seeing what it looks like. So this is a di uh, sort of plot showing the noise in the electrical port and the noise in the optical port in the case where we're in a thermally dominated noise regime in the experiment. And one interesting thing that you find is that you can look at these autocorrelations, but you could also look at a cross-correlation between these two. So I could look at a correlation between the electrical port and the optical port, and I find that, in fact, the noises are very correlated. Um, both ports contain a redund redundant record of the thermal noise in the system. So if I look at that in terms of my diagram of my converter, I might think about operating this where I have um, some signal uh, coming in in, say, the microwave port, and I want to upconvert it to the optical port. And then I, I don't put any signal in this port here. Let's say that's just vacuum. Uh, what I come out with if this converter is coupled to some thermal bath is some thermal noise. But I could imagine, because they're correlated in these two ports, I could use a feed-forward mechanism to get rid of some of the noise uh, in the uh, electrical signal that's coming out. So classically, this seems like a great idea, right? I mean, I can remove a lot of noise. Uh, in a quantum domain, right, uh, this ancilla, if I just have a uh, if I don't do anything special to it, I'll have a half a quanta of noise that comes out here. Okay, so that's adding noise to my system if I were to try to uh, do some sort of quantum feed forward. I could imagine, though, injecting a squeezed vacuum here, right? And if I do that, I could actually, via this feed forward protocol, uh, upconvert one quadrature noiselessly. And through certain decodings, maybe that uh, could be useful. But it's been fun to just look at these electro-optic correlations some and see what a classical feedforward can do. <coughs> so this is some noise on some signal coming out of the converter uh, with this feedforward process here off. And with the feedforward on, we can actually see that we decrease the noise some. If we look at this in a sort of frequency domain picture where we look at um, this thermal noise showing up as a resonant peak of the device, uh, in the noise spectrum at the output, and we vary the feed forward weight. How much are we feeding forward? Uh, we see that we are able to decrease uh, the noise here at that point there by about 60% while keeping the cooperativity of the device the same. So at the beginning, remember I said that everything in these uh, quantum optical mechanics systems depends upon cooperativity, and it's generally you know, seen that you really want that high cooperativity. But there's something that you can do here that's sort of trading off if I had a really efficient device, uh, I could actually have a lower cooperativity and, and get to the same point. Now you see, though, that um, you know, nothing is coming for free here in the sense that efficiency really, really matters if you want to do these types of things. And uh, you start to see that as, as you feed forward more and more, this noise floor is going up because you're dominated by the microwave measurement chain. But you can compare this to sort of what I would get via laser cooling or sort of increasing the cooperativity as you would usually do. And for our case where some bad things are happening as we increase the laser power, um, we find that we can do, uh, we can do you know, sort of just as well if we apply this feed forward protocol. 
So that's some sort of cute things that we can do with electro-optic correlations that work well in the classical domain. And, and maybe there's even some applications in the quantum domain if you have a very efficient system. OK, so <laughs> this is just going to be a slide concluding some parts about this electro-optic converter. And then I'm going to go on and talk uh, for a little while about um, purely optomechanical measurements and some other uh, types of ideas that we can look at. So we've created an electro-optic converter uh, that is sort of approaching being quantum enabled. We're sort of pretty excited that we're getting down to sort of this 10 photon level and maybe pretty soon uh, we can think about experiments where we do entanglement of optical and electrical fields based upon these devices and uh, really make use of this sort of world of superconducting qubits in the optical domain. Um, in Conrad's group, this is a picture of Conrad, I haven't uh, shown it yet, uh, they've actually been sort of working separately on the other side of things with pure electromechanical devices where they have a transmon uh, qubit that's able to send a superposition state from that transmon qubit into a mechanical object. So that's sort of the first step of the type of things that we need to do in order then to convert it to, to light. Um, so uh, we like to think of our experiments as uh, we really are working on both halves separately and also the, the integration. On the optomechanical side, um, in a moment I'm going to sort of tell some separate stories of how we're doing if we don't try to combine all of this stuff with the electrical components which complicate things how well we can do with the optomechanical device. And sort of our charge, you know, Conrad's charge is, okay, put the qubit in there and couple it to the mechanics. Our charge is, uh, with that capability, can we really, you know, operate this thing in the dilution refrigerator, really be in the ground state, and very efficiently detect and do homodyne and heterodyne, and maybe ultimately um, sort of single photon counting at the output of this optical system. So I'll tell you some stories that, that say that uh, we, can, we can do this at, at some level at these extreme cryogenic temperatures. So let me remind you a little bit about this optomechanical system. So it's this little slab of dielectric that sits in this fabry pruro cavity. And for some you know, sense of scale, uh, for maybe people who are used to ion traps, right, where you think about um, harmonic oscillator motion scales and you think of your zero point motion as tens of nanometers, uh, in these experiments the zero point motion of these objects is femtometer scale. So that's the scale at which we're detecting uh, the motion of these objects. So in these experiments we really do require very low noise lasers. So we start with a really low noise YAG laser, we filter it after that um, to, get, to get really low noise at the re relevant frequency. Uh, and we need to couple our optical mode uh, well to the spatial uh, motion of this mechanical membrane. So this is a real picture of coupling the optical mode just to the, to the right part of the membrane. Uh, we also can do some fancier things to control the mechanical elements. So we can make uh, phononic shields or phononic band gaps. This is a, one of our optomechanical devices that you can't see terribly well in this particular picture, um, but you see these sort of array of um, black pieces uh, that corresponds to the array of blue pieces down here that are periodically arranged masses that actually form a, a phononic shield, um, a phononic band gap that doesn't allow radiation of the relevant uh, frequency of this mechanical object. So it's really trying to isolate the particular acoustical mode of, of interest. So in these experiments, instead of, you know, trapping some object and isolating it in terms of vacuum, uh, we isolate uh, with these phononic shields. And we're isolating better and better. So people are, are getting pretty extreme quality factors with these devices now. So why do you put this? Why do you put the phononic shield? Yeah, so it's, uh, if you think of it in this picture here, it's, it's within this green part. So it's sort of the frame that holds the, the membrane here. So this little bit here, this white thing, I operate this pointer here, uh, this white thing is what <laughs> vibrates, and then the, the shield is a bunch of silicon masses. And it's a pretty large scale. So this whole thing is a centimeter uh, because we're working at megahertz frequencies. So this is a plot showing the fact that with these devices, especially with these phononic shields, we can ground state laser cool uh, this uh, motion of this mechanical object. So this is the, the phonon occupation that we actually measure via sideband asymmetry measurement that if we're used to trapped ion experiments, it's, a, it's basically extremely analogous. So in this case, we apply a red detuned uh, 
pump with respect to the cavity resonance. And again, this is the analogy to atomic laser cooling. Um, we have sidebands that are uh, asymmetric. And then we look at the symmetry of those sidebands. And in this particular configuration, when we hit what we refer to as a back action limit, but in atomic physics, you would refer to it as the Doppler limit, uh, these uh, sidebands sort of come into equilibrium due to the finite resolution of the cavity. So we can see that we can cool down to a phonon occupation of about 0.2, which is 80% ground state fraction. But again, it's just limited by the sideband resolution. And our sort of extraneous occupation that you might think of as the difference between where we get to and where we might expect is on the order of sort of 0.03 uh, phonons. So we can really cool these um, to pretty extreme temperatures, um, you know, not at the 99.9% .9 level yet. Um, but, uh, but uh, getting there with a continuous optical probing. So in a lot of nanoscale optomechanical systems, uh, it's hard to put light in there and not have it heat up. But in these systems, we can just keep the probe on, and it, and it just works. So in that last slide, I was talking about sort of controlling the mechanics with the, with the light. Uh, but another thing that you want to think about is how well do I get the information out about the mechanical object through the light? And this is related to how I think about um, continuous displacement detection of a mechanical object and an idea known as the standard quantum limit, uh, where there's many standard quantum limits within quantum physics, right? But I'm going to tell you about one that's you know, particular to this, to this field. So the standard quantum limit, as referred to continuous displacement detection, really arose out of ideas in, for example, LIGO, where they were thinking about how well can I measure the displacement of an object. And what you find is that if you probe at sort of low optical powers, uh, you probably would be shot noise limited if you get rid of all of technical limitations to the noise. And so your spectrum might look like this, an imprecision background uh, with a little bit of a peak on top of it. Uh, and then if you keep increasing the probe power, though, eventually you beat down shot noise, but you'll eventually have some back action appear in the system. And that back action uh, is sort of a, a white uh, force noise, but you filtered by the mechanical response. And then you would get sort of a back action peak that looks like this. And you'll find um, that if you're probing on the mechanical resonance, that your measurement added noise from the combination of shot noise and back action um, will be equal to the contribution from mechanical um, zero point motion of the object. Okay? And sort of what is the, the physical origin of this? And also a little bit of, of history. So this is an abstract from about 1980 by Carl Caves called Quantum Mechanical Radiation Pressure Fluctuations in an Interferometer. And it says, uh, the interferometers uh, now being developed to detect gravitational waves work by measuring small changes in the position of free masses. Okay, And there's been a controversy whether quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations disturb this measurement. Um, this letter resolves the controversy. They do. So, uh, so first of all, it's a good example of how to write an abstract. Um, but it, it also tells you a little bit about the history of this field. So at this point, people were thinking about LIGO measurements and are we going to be limited by uh, what I'm going to call radiation pressure shot noise and what he is calling here radiation pressure fluctuations. So this is I have light in the interferometer. It's pushing on the mechanical element. And there's some shot noise on that light. Uh, so that means there's going to be some fluctuating force on the mechanical element. So there's going to be some, some pushes to the mechanical element, some recoil. So in atomic physics, we're very used to recoil, right? But in these contexts, um, it's hard to, hard to see. And those fluctuations, over time, if I'm trying to make a continuous displacement measurement, those little forces are going to turn into displa displacement fluctuations that will uh, perturb the measurement. Uh, so people worried about this. Um, and you know, in LIGO to this day, uh, these quantum mechanical uh, radiation pressure fluctuations have actually not been important um, to observing a gravitational wave signal. Uh, but it set off a lot of uh, ideas in quantum optics. And uh, sort of part of resolving this controversy was understanding how a beam splitter works in, in quantum optics. So some of the things that, that you can do in this domain uh, where shot noise on light is actually uh, 
driving your object through radiation pressure is you can actually squeeze light uh, using the mechanical element. So you can think of an optomechanical system in certain domains as actually a Kerr medium. Uh, because it's an uh, intensity dependent index of refraction because the radiation pressure is intensity dependent and it's going to change the effective length of the cavity so it's changing some effective index. So in some domain where your shot noise of radiation pressure or the amplitude of light drives the mechanics, the mechanical element is then writing back onto the phase of the light in the cavity and this will give you correlations between amplitude and phase which is what can give rise to squeezing of the light. So this is a, a picture of the power spectrum of some light compared to shot noise as a function of frequency right near a mechanical resonance in a certain domain where we're measuring. And we can see that we get um, suppression below shot noise here. And in our experiments, the sort of efficiency that we can get in the measurement uh, gives us squeezing right now of sort of 2.7 dB um, with these devices. Um, so it's a fairly easy way in some ways to, to create squeezed light, although it's a very narrow band squeeze light. Uh, and it's also a really good uh, sort of calibrator of the system. The best way to know that you really got your efficiency right is to measure squeezing and see that it comes out to be the, to be the right thing. So squeezing has played a role in people thinking about quantum limits to detection and how I can get around them. And so we've been able to reproduce some of these ideas within the context of these micromechanical systems. So even though these ideas have been thought about for a long time in the context of, for example, LIGO, uh, in most you know, large test mass systems, it's really hard to get into a regime where these um, radiation pressure fluctuations actually have an effect. Uh, so what, what do you expect to see? So it's important to ask what you expect to see not only at the peak of the mechanical response, but also in a, in a broadband sense. So this is a picture that I call my illustrated guide to broadband detection in the context of quantum measurement. And what we're looking at here is some position fluctuations that tell us about the noise on the measurement that I'd be trying to measure some signal on top of. And I might care about this, this whole spectrum uh, from the context of displacement sensing, where I don't just care about the peak of the mechanical response, but some broadband thing, or if I want to do force sensing over, over some bandwidth. So in that original standard quantum limit plot that I, that I showed you, um, I showed you the point where the back action and the shot noise were equal, and that was a standard quantum limit. Here I'm showing a case where the, the, the power is large enough that the back action actually dominates. And I'm looking what happens as a function of, of power, and I see that the back action response actually drops with the mechanical response, and that here I actually find that I'm at the standard quantum limit as defined off mechanical resonance at, at this point over here. So if I look at this um, in the context of, for example, LIGO measurements, so here I'm showing you the displacement noise as a function of frequency for the 01 run of advanced LIGO, which is where they saw the gravitational waves. And you can see this blue line here corresponds to the uh, quantum limit, and it goes down just like that curve I was showing you on the previous page and sort of flattens out, it goes up here because of some response function of the optical system. And you can see that the actual noise that they measured was far above anything that was, that was quantum. What they do care about in, in LIGO as sort of a first attempt to use anything quantum about the light is using squeezed light where they actually uh, deal with this domain out here where they're uh, shot noise limited. And here they're, they're squeezing the light to, to deal with that problem. And in general, amplitude or phase squeezed light, what it's going to do to this sort of standard quantum limit curve, it's going to move it just to the left and to the right if I have pure phase or, or amplitude squeezing. In future iterations, though, they show plots like this saying that, uh, okay, we are going to be quantum noise limited, so maybe this will someday be relevant. So let's go back to this picture here and think about it in the context of what is the standard quantum limit? What does it mean for LIGO? What does it mean for sort of on resonant detection? So if I think about the standard quantum limit as the point where the back action and shot noise um, are equal to each other if I have the ability to, to move power around, what I see is that on mechanical resonance uh, that corresponds to adding the equivalent of the zero point motion. 
off mechanical resonance, though, it starts to deviate in the sense that uh, what I would expect, if I were to think about the system uh, as sort of the probe as being an amplifier, I would expect to add a zero point of, of noise um, sort of at all frequencies, and that's what I would refer to as this quantum limit here. And you can see that there's a fair bit of difference between what I would call this standard quantum limit and what I'm calling a quantum limit here. And one very confusing thing about these types of systems where I have these often mechanical interactions is there's both a mechanical mode and an optical mode. And I often want to think about, if I'm thinking about some quantum limit, am I thinking about non-commutation of the mechanical quadratures or am I thinking about non-commutation of the optical quadratures? And sort of this black line here corresponds to um, what I would think if I think about the non-commutation of the mechanical quadratures. And this is what I get from the non-commutation of the optical quadratures in some particular measurement configuration, which corresponds to a typical measurement where I'm just measuring the phase of the light at the output of the cavity. So all of this is to say that there's actually a way to set up your interferometer where you can get below the standard quantum limit off mechanical resonance um, just by, for example, changing the homodyne angle of your detector. And then you would get this red curve here, which doesn't go below this black line here, uh, but does go below the SQL and is some of the ideas in, in sort of uh, original sort of LIGO proposals about how I can deal with my off mechanical resonance noise. And when I do this thing where I'm varying this angle, sort of varying this homodyne angle, what I find is that I actually would want to set a different angle for different frequencies. So I'd want to do something what, that they refer to as variational. I'd like to vary that angle as a function uh, of frequency. So if I look at this in sort of my original picture where I'm uh, changing my measurement strength and I have my shot noise and my back action, in my sort of typical measurement configuration, I would get this. And in my sort of varied measurement configuration, I would get this, where I see something that dips below the standard quantum limit. So in our experiments, we can measure this standard quantum limit idea. We can see the noise go down as a function of our probing, and then we can see it come back up again. Uh, it's a bit above the standard quantum limit because of our finite efficiency, but we get pretty close. And this efficiency is the same thing that comes into, for example, our electro-optic converter. And these different lines go down here because we're measuring um, not only on the mechanical resonance, but off the mechanical resonance as well. So what we see as we tune this interferometer, the homodyne angle, is very similar to what we would see if we were doing this um, optomechanical squeezing of light. We get correlations between phase and amplitude, and those can uh, uh, add up or subtract in certain regions of parameter space so that I actually end up doing a little bit of a better measurement in this part <coughs> of frequency space. So if I look at this in the context of the standard quantum limit, uh, this blue line here is the standard quantum limit. And I find that if I change my me measurement configuration a little bit, I use the little bit of this squeezing that I'm getting through my optomechanical interaction, I can actually measure better than the standard quantum limit by a little bit. Uh, but nonetheless, sort of looking at these limits and, and how we can modify them um, based upon correlations. And we can even see that the angle that we would want to set our homodyne detector would be different as a function of frequency, just pre as predicted by these LIGO proposals that said, well, you better vary that angle as a function of frequency. We aren't actively varying it in our device, uh, but we can sort of see the idea in these experiments. So all of this last bit was to sort of tell you the notion that we can see these radiation pressure fluctuations in our interferometer. We can study these sort of historical limits of continuous displacement detection um, to try to get around uh, this idea of sort of recoil within the context of an optomechanical system. So with that, um, I think I'm wrapping up here. So uh, I want to thank both the members of uh, my group as well as Conrad Leonard's group. This is really a collaboration between um, different teams working in different areas. Uh, in the context of the electro-optic correlations experiments that I talked about, um, postdoc Andrew Higginbotham and graduate students Pete Burns and Max Yermi were very influential. Uh, this variational readout and quantum limits uh, near Campbell and Bob Peterson. Uh, we've been starting to work with quantum information theorist Graham Smith, um, who's now at Jilla. 
And these are our groups. Um, as Oriel said at the beginning, um, we work both with control of motion of single atomic systems and these optomechanical devices. And Conrad's group work with superconducting qubits. Um, Conrad's group is apparently much better at sporting um, than my team. Uh, so they, uh, they won some cup here. And I wanted to mention at the end that we do have a, a postdoc position available, in particular on sort of the optical side of this electro-optic project. We're uh, close enough to these quantum limits that we're sort of ramping up our efforts in that direction. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Cindy, for the very nice talk. So now we open time for questions. Are there any? Yeah, sir. So in this last scheme you described, um, where you change the phase in your homodyne detection, is this similar to, for example, uh, operating the cavity in a detune regime where you introduce correlations between the two quadratures? Or? Uh, so it in a, so there's, there's different ways that I can mix the quadratures, right? I mean, I can, I can look at homodyne at different angles, but I can also detune with respect to the cavity. And in, in fact, <coughs> with, when I showed that squeezing data, which I refer to as ponder motive squeezing, just in case I throw that word in, there we were actually just detuning from the cavity. Um, if that answers your question? More or less. Yeah, OK. So I was wondering, um, uh, you told us that you're using uh, active, c you're using active cooling, laser cooling, was it feedback cooling? I'm not sure. Um, to cool your membrane, do you do the same in the converter, or why does it only heat up by 40 millikelvin when you shine laser on it? Does, is is it um, uh, is there very little of the laser light being absorbed, or because you want to have the coupling to the phononic bath around the very weak, right? So um, the thermal coupling will be, will be really bad. Yeah, OK. So a couple different questions in there. So um, one is the relation between laser cooling and the converter. And so, so basically, they're one and the same thing. And this, this is always sort of a point of uh, you know, coming to grips with what's going on here, is that this laser cooling is like a, people also call it cold damping. Right? And this idea of having high cooperativity is just the fact that there's this competition of rates. There's a sort of optical measurement phonon, phonon, phonon photon exchange rate, and there's this thermalization rate. So basically, for the converter, we don't have to first cool to the ground state and then operate it. We need to uh, pump hard enough and work hard enough at getting that exchange rate high that it's larger than the thermal environment causing problems. Um, so, so yeah, we don't laser pre-cool. We just put on the pumps and, and go. Um, the second part of the question, I think, had to do with why is it OK to put on those pumps, and why does it not heat the membrane? So that's a very good question and something that we've always been very worried about. right? So what comes into that equation is in the context of these phonon shields, right? they're in a very particular range of frequency space. right? And you can ask about what phonons are actually doing the, the thermal conduction. But, it, but if you ask about it from a perspective of, like, what is the thermal conductivity of silicon nitride at 100 millikelvin? And what is the absorption? And what does that mean for how much it'll heat up? So unfortunately, neither of those numbers were numbers that we could really know before we did this experiment. So I would say that you know, that combination of numbers we know better than some set of people somewhere. Uh, but it's really hard to know to know the difference. Um, I would say that the absorption corresponds to like the best absorption you would observe in silicon nitride, um, probably on the order of sort of uh, dB per meter scale, if that number means anything. Uh, so the absorption is very small. Um, and the thermal conductivity is apparently enough um, that that particular mode is cold. There's another question, too, of if I laser heat my membrane, and some modes are hot, are they really well coupled to the one mode that we care about? That's another question. Um, let's see, getting lost in all the different things here. So there's also the, the point of we do observe some heating. So what we see is that when we go below 100 millikelvin, our best guess is that some thermal conductivity is really going to something very small. And so we do see heating. 
So that's why we operate at 100 millikelvin and sort of not 40 millikelvin. That was a lot of answers to your question. <laughs> was that enough? OK. Um, maybe let me also ask another question about the converter. So you said the deficiency now is 48%. So the question is, what is the bottleneck now in current experiments, and what is the prospect mm -hmm. for increasing that number? Yeah, so the, the efficiency is pretty much dominated by the optical side of things. So, so you know, it's our cavity's fault, uh, sort of. So the, the main thing that we think is happening is as we cool down the device, the fabry perot cavity, although it stays pretty good, it tilts a little bit. Um, so the combination of, of mode matching is like 90%. Um, and then our, uh, you know, our internal loss is not unlike the external loss. So it's really sort of cavity alignment type things that we think would make the biggest difference. Um, but you know, I would say that we're probably not going to get above sort of 70 or 80% in some reasonable device likely. Now keep in mind that they, these numbers are all just the converter box too. So if I want to do some of these feed forward schemes that I was talking about, you also need the whole measurement chain to be very efficient. Um, and that's pretty efficient in the optical domain. Um, in the microwave domain, it's, it's not, because we're just using a hemp amplifier. Are there any further questions? OK, so if this is not the case, let's thank our speaker again. And uh, recall that now we have some coffees and pastries, and you can also use this time to ask more private questions to our speaker. So thank you.